Yeah, yeah. so, um, yep, that's me. <laughs> I am a registered dietitian. Um, and so that's what RD means on, on those, all those, that alphabet suit behind my name. The, um, I have my master's and then I um, have a specialized certification in sports nutrition. So that's that CSSD and then I'm licensed in the state of Texas. So that's, that's what those, sometimes I get questions about that. So, um, and then a little bit about my background. So um, I graduate, I'm from Houston originally. So I'm a native Houstonian. I um, played volleyball in high school growing up and then eventually into college and, um, and where I got my bachelor's degree in biology. And so I went to Furman University in South Carolina, if anybody's familiar, it's a nice little liberal arts school out in South Carolina. Um, and then Texas was calling me back home. Um, I loved science and I loved working with athletes and active populations. And so I wanted to find a way to kind of combine those things. And so nutrition was a nice fit. And so um, I came back and went to Texas A&M and got my master's in nutrition. Um, and then to be a dietitian, you have to do a dietetic internship. So I ended up back in Houston for that through the University of Houston. Um, and so that's kind of my education background. And then currently I am a sports dietitian with Memorial Hermann Ironman Sports Medicine Institute. Um, and through that position, I have a few different roles. I've been there a, a little over four years now. Um, so currently I'm the team dietitian for the Houston Dash, which is the women's professional soccer team. Um, they just won their Challenge Cup back in July, so that was really exciting to um, support them through that. I also work with college athletes at Houston Baptist University. We are partnered with a few local high schools, um, and then I also do one-on-one -on -one counseling in clinic. Um, and then kind of secondary to all of that, I recently took an adjunct uh, professor, professor um, uh, job at Houston Baptist University teaching nutrition. So um, a lot of different things, but I think that's the best thing about my job is I get to kind of work with a lot of different populations. And then um, expanding to you guys in the dance community has been really great and um, I've gotten to learn a lot more about it. So I'm excited to present to you guys today as well. All right, so we can kind of jump into the topics that we're gonna cover today. Um, so um, we're gonna start with just general needs. Um, and so this is gonna be a really rough estimation um, of calories and macronutrients. So again, this is something that's very individualized and, um, and really there's a lot of ranges out there. And so again, these are just guidelines. Um, from there, we'll move on to a little bit of nutrient timing. So I'm sure all of you guys schedule looks a little bit different. So I wanna kind of give you again, just some guidelines around what to eat and when, and when it's important to take in certain nutrients. Um, Molly mentioned that there were uh, potentially some of you that are vegan or vegetarian or maybe limiting, um, you know, meat or dairy or other animal products. And so I want to kind of talk about what that looks like and how to optimize diets where maybe we're not consuming as many animal products. And then finally, I want to wrap up on just touching on some of the risks for underfueling. Um, this is something that I've just gotten to learn a lot more about um, in the past few years and become really passionate about with all of my athletes and making sure that they are giving their body what it needs so that not only that they can be healthy, but they can be um, kind of optimizing their performance as well. All right, so just a little disclaimer, I really, I, I won't be able to address specific individual needs um, during this presentation. Again, everything's gonna be kind of general, but if you have any further questions, I'm happy to discuss them you know, in a one-on-one -on -one setting. And I'll put up my email at the end. Um, and we also offer kind of discounted rates for nutrition counseling. And so I'll talk about that at the end if you think it might be, that's something you might be interested in. So, okay, starting with um, absolute minimum caloric needs. And I always like to, to just draw kind of a, a line in the sand, if you will, of what is the minimum amount that you should be consuming. Um, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's a lot of pressure on dancers um, and certain, achieving certain aesthetics. And a lot of times that ends up in under fueling. And so I always like to set a baseline. And so based on the research, and we'll kind of talk a little bit more about what happens when maybe we go under this, later, but based on the research, this 30 calories per kilogram of fat-free mass is kind of this like 
lowest you should ever go. Um, and even then maybe is a little bit low. And so I always like to set a baseline. So in order to kind of calculate for that self, you'll need a body composition measurement in terms of your body fat percentage. Um, we use Bod Pod in clinic, if you guys have ever seen that, but there are handheld ways and there are some scales where again, you can just kind of get a rough estimate of, of where you're at. So taking your body weight and dividing it by 2.2, that will get you your body weight in kilograms. So um, kind of we're working more on the European side of things. So your body weight in kilograms. In order to calculate how much fat-free mass you have, you will then multiply that body weight times the percentage of fat-free mass, and then take that number and multiply it by 30. So, so what does that look like in, in, a, in a human? So if you're about 130 pounds and you have about 21% body fat, so we would take that 130 pounds, we divide it by 2.2, that would give us our weight in kilograms, which is about 59. And then we multiply that by 0.79. So if we did 100 minus 21, we'd get 79. So that's our percentage of fat-free mass. And then that would give us 46.6 .6 kilograms of fat-free mass. And then I think it just got cut off, but we would multiply that by 30. So that kilograms of fat-free mass by 30 calories, and which gets us... A, right at 1400 calories. So if you are 130 pounds and you are eating under 1400 calories, chances are you are working in a serious deficit and there are some risks to that. And so I always like to set this baseline. Optimum is gonna be a little bit higher potentially. Um, I like to set this baseline if for some reason you are trying to achieve um, safe weight loss or safe fat loss. Um, then really not going any lower in, than this number is, is important just for overall health. So um, I like to set that in there. And then um, on the next slide, we can kind of see some of our macronutrient needs. So for those of you who maybe haven't heard the term macronutrient before, that's totally fine. Uh, lots of people maybe haven't heard that or um, understood that. So macronutrients are what is in our food that is providing us energy in the form of calories. So anything that you eat that has calories in it is coming from protein, carbohydrates, or fats. Alcohol is a little different, um, but or some kind of combination of protein, carbohydrates, and fats. Um, and so we give um, the research that I was kind of looking into gives, again, just these general macronutrient ranges. Um, for protein, 1.2 to 1.7 grams per kilogram, and then carbs, the two to four grams per kilogram. With carbohydrates, it will kind of depend on how, um, how demanding and how high intensity your, your classes or rehearsals are. So if your heart rate never really gets that high during any of your training, chances are your carbohydrate needs won't be that high, but if you are in a more aerobic um, type of dance or you're sweating a ton and your heart rate's really elevated throughout your classes or rehearsals, then you may need to be on the higher side of the carbohydrates. And then fats, one gram per kilogram is pretty consistent across the board for most athletes. Um, so what, again, what does that look like for our athlete that's 130 pounds? So we, again, we get that 59 kilograms. For protein, that would be somewhere between 70 to 100 grams per day. For carbohydrates, maybe 110, 120 on the low end, up to 230, maybe 250 on the high end, and then about 60 grams of fat. And when we kind of work out those calorie ranges, if we were to consume on the low end for all of those things, we'd, we'd be a little bit lower than that 1400 that we were kind of shooting for on the previous slide. Um, whereas if we maybe had more intense or longer periods of training, we might need to be a little bit closer to that 18, 1900 calorie amount. So again, I don't think everybody needs to track calories. I, I find it really unsustainable to do that long-term, but if you're concerned about being too low or too high, it may be helpful for you to kind of calculate these ranges to better understand maybe where your needs are there. Okay, nutrient timing. So what are, where do we find our macronutrients in food and when, can, when should we consume them and why? So the first one is carbohydrates. So, you know, we think about carbohydrates, we find them in grains, 
So we find them in starchy vegetables um, and we find them in fruit as well. So grains being things like pasta, rice, potatoes, breads, or sorry, <laughs> pasta, rice, breads, oatmeal, cereals, granola, right? Anything that's kind of a grain product or is coming from grains. Um, fruit, all of our fruit is going to be an excellent carbohydrate source. And then um, our starchy vegetables as well. So starchy vegetables being things like potatoes, peas, corn. Um, maybe as we get a little bit cooler into the fall season, things like acorn and butternut squash will have a little bit more starch to them as well. Um, so if we could click to that next slide. Perfect. Okay, so there's kind of the, the general groups of our carbohydrates. So this is where we're finding carbohydrates in our food. Okay, um, the next source is fats. Okay, so fats are unique and that they are our most energy dense nutrient. So we get about nine calories per gram of fat, which is great. Um, fats are not to be feared. We have, we need fats in our daily diet. Um, they are essential for vitamin absorption. We can only absorb some of our vitamins when we are consuming them with fats. And so I think about kind of major groups of fats are gonna be things like nuts and seeds, um, avocados or maybe olives, so some of those vegetables that have a little bit more fat or fruits, I guess, with an avocado. And, um, and then oils as well, oils, butter, um, you know, any kind of plant-based oil is a fat option. And then of course we have maybe kind of those junk foods or fun foods that are a little bit higher in fat. Um, typically, the biggest distinction between those kind of top three and the bottom one is our unsaturated and saturated fats. So those top three um, plant-based sources of fats tend to be more unsaturated um, and maybe some more of our maybe like fun foods um, or even some of our animal-based fats will be more saturated. And really, we do need some saturated fat in our diet, but we want a good balance. And so we want to try to prioritize those unsaturated plant-based fats as much as possible. Okay, so the reason I bring up carbohydrates and fats um, first is because those are your muscles' preferred source of energy. So in your training, in your rehearsals, in your classes, you are going to be using some combination of carbohydrates and fats depending on the intensity. So right now, you guys are mostly at rest. I'm assuming you're all kind of sitting at your computer. Um, if you're sleeping or even very low intensity exercise, so maybe stretching um, before classes or rehearsals, your body's preferred source of energy is fats. So we get a lot of energy. So if any of you guys remember back to biology class, ATP is kind of our cell's energy molecule. We can make a lot of ATP from fat. And so your body likes to do that, but it just takes a little bit longer. But while we're at rest our, or you know, low intensity, we don't have a super high energy demand. So our body takes its time and it can make those energy molecules um, from fat. Once we get a little bit more into moderate exercise, so our heart rate is a little bit more elevated. Um, I would assume this is, this is most um, classes or rehearsals for you guys. Um, you're gonna start to tap into a little bit more of your carbohydrate sources in your body. So, you know, we're making as much energy from fat as we can, but you may be working at an intensity where it's you're using fat just isn't keeping up. We need energy a little bit faster, and that's where those carbohydrates come in. So we store carbohydrates, we call it glycogen, in our muscle, and we also have carbohydrates circ circulating around in our blood as glucose. And so once we kind of up the intensity a little bit, we'll start tapping into those carbohydrate stores. Um, and then finally, really intense exercise. So your heart rate is super high. Um, I, I would think lots of jumping or lots of crossing, crossing the floor, crossing the stage. Um, that's where you're maybe using almost exclusively carbohydrate in those. So if your heart rate is really super high and you're sweating and you're huffing and puffing, then, then you're probably using mostly carbohydrate. So likely during a class or during a rehearsal, you guys will kind of waffle back and forth between different intensities and using those different energy sources. Um, but know that, you know, for the most part, most of your energy is coming from fat or from carbohydrate. And then our last micronutrient or macronutrient is protein. 
So I saved it for last. I think it's a common misconception. Um, people think eating a lot of protein is gonna give them energy. And in reality, we don't really use protein for energy, but protein is really important for building and repairing our muscle mass. So Molly, I'm gonna make you work a little bit on this slide, sorry. <laughs> so, okay, so if you imagine your muscle is a brick wall. So we have one guy who is building up our brick wall and one guy who's breaking it down. And in, and in essence, your muscles are always turning over, okay? They get damaged when you train, when you rehearse, you do a little bit of damage to your muscles. That's okay. As long as we're building them back up, then we are creating adaptation. We're getting, um, we're getting stronger. We're, we're learning um, that muscle memory, right? We're, we're building up some stamina in our muscles that way. So we've got one guy who's building it up and one guy who's breaking it down. The only way we can continue to build and repair muscle um, is by providing it protein through our food. So our body really won't pull protein from other essential organs or places like that. It has to come from our diet. So if you click next, um, great. So now we've eaten some protein and it's digested down and now it's come to our brick builder. So now he has the materials that he needs to build our muscle, right? Um, and then the only caveat is that it's on a conveyor belt. Um, so if we click one more time, Perfect. So um, once we eat this protein, it comes down and it's available to our muscles, but probably only for about three to five hours after that meal. And so after three to five hours, if you click one more time, um, those proteins kind of move down the conveyor belt. And so our, our brick builder no longer has access to them. So the idea being, if you click to the next slide, is we want to consume protein on a pretty consistent basis. And I think especially for the dance population where you're likely, you know, so you're likely teaching classes or you maybe you have several classes or rehearsals throughout the day where you have, you're having several times where you're, you're kind of breaking down your muscle a little bit during your training. And so we want to make sure that we are giving our muscle the most opportunities to build and repair throughout the day as we can. And so what that looks like is, you know, consuming some kind of protein source, probably every three to five hours or so, and, and maybe trying to kind of optimize some of that protein intake between training sessions as, as possible. So you can see on this example, um, in the morning, you know, when you first wake up, if you haven't eaten any protein in a while, which unless you're like eating in the middle of the night, most of you haven't, um, you're in what's called a negative protein balance. And so we're breaking it down. Essentially, we're breaking down more muscle than we're building up. So our brick builder doesn't have any materials for him at this point. Um, once we eat that protein, now we're in a positive balance where we can build and repair muscle. And so you can see that kind of ebbs and flows throughout the day where after our meals, we're in the positive balance for a few hours and then eventually we drop down. So again, thinking about um, consuming protein on a little bit more consistent basis. Um, so if you go to the next slide, the, the next question I always get is, well, how much? And so again, this will be based on your total body weight. So general recommendations that are um, kind of most prominent in some of our sport nutrition literature is going to be this 0.25 to 0.4 grams per kilogram per meal, okay? For most people, that is probably going to be somewhere between 15 and 30 grams of protein. So if you weigh a little bit less, you'll be closer to 15. Um, and if you weigh a little bit more, you may be closer to 30. And what this range is, this is the range that's going to optimize your muscle's ability to build and repair. So kind of on the low side of things, so if you're at least getting 15, we're still kind of maxing out. If we get a little bit closer to 30 for a bigger person, then, um, then that's going to be kind of our optimal dose of protein for that next three to five hour stretch. Um, and so again, timing every three to four, maybe five hours at the most. And then thinking about types of protein. So ideally we choose what we consider high quality proteins or complete proteins. And really what that means is um, they have all of the essential amino acids. So amino acids are what make up proteins and our body can synthesize some of those amino acids, but some of it we can't synthesize. And so we have to get from our diet. In general, um, our animal proteins, so either eating animals or their byproducts, will be a, a high quality complete protein because it has all of those essential amino acids in it. Um, and 
for the most part, there are some exce exceptions, our plant-based proteins tend to be missing one or more of those essential amino acids. So that's not to say we can't optimize a plant-based diet because we can, and we'll kind of talk about some ways to do that. So um, on the next slide, these are just examples of portion sizing for some of our animal-based proteins. So if you do consume meat, um, about three ounces of meat is going to be about the size of the palm of your hand or, you know, a deck of cards. So again, not, we don't really need large amounts of protein. We need more moderate amounts kind of consistently throughout the day. So three to four ounces will get you 20 to 30 grams of protein. You know, um, for if you were going to make a deli meat sandwich, think like three to five slices. For if you do eat fish, fish tends to be a little bit flatter and so maybe a little bit bigger like a cell phone size. An egg will be about um, seven grams, six or seven grams of protein. Uh, one cup of milk will get you about seven grams of protein. And then I, um, Greek yogurt will get you about 10 to 15 cottage cheese, um, depending on how much will get you, well, most will get you around 10 to 15 grams of protein. So with vegan proteins, um, so kind of on the lines of those, those amino acids that are really helpful for muscle growth, leucine is one of those. So leucine is what kind of helps turn on that muscle growth and muscle repair. So when we eat proteins that have leucine, that flips the switch for us so we can build muscle. What, and that tends to be what's maybe lacking the most in some of our, our vegan proteins. So ideally we get about two to three grams of leucine per meal, again, to kind of optimize that growth in repair. Um, and so we do that pretty easily with some of our animal products, but um, it may take a little bit more volume of the plant-based products to kind of reach that same leucine threshold. So on the next slide, I've provided some good options or things that I have found that have been good vegan protein options. Um, the nice thing is, is that plant-based isn't going anywhere, a plant-based diet isn't going anywhere anytime soon. And so a lot of our food manufacturers have caught on to that. And so there are way more options out there, which is which I think is really helpful. If you are um, interested in protein powders, um, plant-based protein powders, there's, there's a lot more on the market now. These are a few of the brands that I trust just kind of um, being in the sports world and, and working a lot with different supplements and things like that. So Vegas Sport is one um, Garden of Life Sport. They have a really nice line of um, proteins. Garden of Life also does a lot of allergy, uh, like common allergen um, friendly items. And so if that is you and you have a lot of different dietary restrictions, and I think Garden of Life, um, their sport line, it would be a really nice option for you. And then this Evolve plant-based protein powder is kind of a newer one to the market, but I like them. They have some of the kind of like typical vanilla and chocolate flavors, but they also do some more fruit-based flavors, which I think makes them a little bit more unique in the protein powder space. But what a lot of these protein powders, these plant-based protein powders have in common is a lot of them will have a pea protein base. And that is because of that leucine amino acid. So peas actually do have a decent amount of leucine. And so finding a plant-based powder that has pea protein in it, you are likely going to get more of that good essential amino acid leucine. So we're gonna be stimulating that muscle growth and repair. Um, if you don't prefer protein powders, I totally get it. Sometimes the taste is, is, a, is a miss. And so um, we have a lot of good, you know, um, whole food based options as well. So tofu is a really nice protein source. Soy is one of our few plant-based protein sources that actually is complete. So that has all of those essential amino acids in it. So things like tofu and edamame are really great options. Even soy milk, if you're interested in a milk substitute. Lentils are really great, um, really actually a pretty good source of protein and beans as well will be nice plant-based sources of protein. Um, what's come out recently, which I think is pretty interesting, are these plant-based pastas. So I've seen more of these on the market. So things like black bean spaghetti listed down there. So you can get up to 20, 25, maybe even 30 grams of protein in a serving with those, which is great. Bonza is another one that I've seen a lot more of, and they have a lot of different types of pasta. So if you want the rotini, um, if you want shells or whatever, I've seen a lot more options in Bonza. Um, someone asked, are the plant-based pastas higher in carbs? Typically, yes. Um, 
you know, well, so the pastas I would say are about the same as like a regular pasta in terms of the carbohydrate load. But in general, plant-based proteins will have more carbohydrate with them. So things like lentils and beans are going to have a little bit more carbohydrate. Um, may, things like tofu um, and edamame will be a little bit lower in carbohydrate. And a lot of times those plant-based protein powders typically are lower in carbohydrate. So again, it is kind of finding that balance um, in your carbohydrate and protein needs as well. So that was, I think someone put that in the chat. That was a good good question overall. But again, the nice thing is, is there's a lot more um, plant-based protein options these days. So I think it makes optimizing the vegan diet a little bit easier. Okay. And so thinking about nutrient timing. So we talked about how with protein, we're really trying to get consistent amounts of protein throughout the day, thinking about every three to five hours. When you're considering what to eat, maybe for classes or rehearsal, I want you to think about how early or how much time you're giving yourself between when you eat and when that, when that class or rehearsal starts. So the farther out you are um, from class rehearsal or even a performance, um, the bigger your meal can be and the more protein, fat, and fiber your meal can have. So proteins, fats, and fibers tend to slow our digestion down and so we don't want tons and tons of those really, really close to any time that we're about to exercise. So for example, eating a really large salad right before you go into a, a, a rehearsal that's gonna be like high intensity is not gonna feel super great because that's that salad or that really high fiber food will sit kind of heavy in your stomach and it will be kind of stuck in your gut when you're trying to exercise. So after we eat, all the blood kind of rushes into our gut to help digest but when we exercise, that blood has to go to our muscles. So if we're trying to exercise after a larger meal or a meal that has a lot of fiber or protein, we're gonna be kind of competing for that blood flow um, to our muscles and to our gut. And a lot of times that ends up in, you know, just some kind of GI discomfort, um, vomiting if it gets high intensity enough. So things that we kind of wanna avoid. Um, but you can see really the main thing that we're focusing on is carbohydrate going into those training sessions. As we get closer to training or competition or performance, you can see that meal size will shrink a little bit and we will be including less of that protein and fat. So remember, we don't really use protein for energy, so we don't need to be consuming a ton of that right before we go into to exercise. And fats, really the fat that we're using for exercise or for energy is coming from the fat already stored on our body. So again, not super essential to eat tons of fat before we go in. And then fiber, same kind of thing. Our body doesn't fully absorb fiber, so we're not getting any kind of energy um, from that as well. So on the next slide, I have just some kind of general things for you guys to think about um, and as far as when you're kind of filling out your meals and timing everything up. So protein ideally is, again, every three to five hours, consuming that kind of 15 to 30 grams of protein. And I think to also really trying to prioritize taking in protein um, post class or rehearsal. So after we've kind of, you know, done that a little bit of damage to our muscles or after we've kind of completed that training, getting some protein in afterwards will be helpful in, in, in getting that recovery process started, that rebuilding and repairing process started. And then also if you have another training session later on, we kind of want to Get that process started so we're not you know we're not kind of compounding once we go into our second training we're, we're a little bit behind the eight ball then for carbohydrates thinking about prioritizing those around classes and rehearsals so leading into you know different sessions that you have throughout the day consuming some carbohydrate is going to help you keep your energy high and so you're probably going to get more out of that training session um, in terms of technique or you know trying to learn a new skill if you are consuming some of that carbohydrate beforehand. Um, and then with fat and fiber and protein, thinking about not consuming really high amounts of those really close to when you will be exercising or rehearsing just for GI issues. Um, so this is kind of where convenience foods may be helpful for you guys, just depending on your schedule. So if you have classes back to back 
or you have training times back to back, it may be helpful to have some of these maybe more packaged foods available, just kind of toss them in your bag and have them ready to go. So things like protein bars or powders, if you want to pack or protein drinks and things like that are convenient sources. So I'm not anti-protein powders or drinks or anything. I think we don't want them to replace like meals necessarily or like whole food options throughout your whole day. But in times where you may not, you may not be able to consume a whole food meal, then I think protein bars or supplements can be a nice option. And then same thing with carbohydrates. So packing things like little granola bars or maybe fruit or dried fruit, having a little bit of juice, um, on hand if you feel like you can't handle solid food before going into your next session, then juice will be something that can give you a little bit of that carbohydrate um, and energy going into your next session there. Okay, moving into some considerations for vegan and vegetarian, um, um, some of our vegan and vegetarian friends. So nutrients of concern for vegans and vegetarians, obviously protein, which we kind of already touched on and just finding those good high quality protein sources. We also wanna think about iron, calcium, vitamin D, and B12. So starting with iron, iron is super important for a lot of different things. Um, so iron is gonna be important for oxygen, transport, and storage. And um, I think if you can flip to that next slide, I'll have it on there. So, um, you know, we, in, our, in all of our red blood cells, we have hemoglobin and that is where the oxygen sits. And so the whole role of our red blood cells is to transport oxygen. But if we are low in iron, we are not gonna be able to transport that oxygen as well. Um, it's important for energy metabolism, so breaking down our food and turning it into usable energy, DNA synthesis, um, cognitive development, um, even neurotransmitters and some of our hormones will rely on iron. And then our immune system, um, you know, can suffer if we, if we are a little bit iron deficient. So what are some of our daily recommended values? Um, if you are, if you are not, if you do eat meat, so on the next slide, you can see if you do eat meat or you are including animal products in your diet, your, um, your recommended daily intake is going to be around eight milligrams for males and for females about 18. So females are typically higher because we menstruate monthly. Um, most of us, you know, maybe birth control, you don't as much, but women just tend to have higher iron needs overall. If you are more of a plant-based kind of person and you're not consuming a lot of animal products, your iron needs are actually going to be a little bit higher because the iron that's available in our, or the iron that we get in some of our plant-based foods isn't super bioavailable. So we end up needing to consume a little bit more. So we can see for males, it bumps up to 14 and for females, it may go a little bit closer to 27 to 32 milligrams per day. So we're going to have to find a little bit more um, iron in there. So what do we, what do we know as symptoms for iron deficiency? Um, confusion, poor concentration, maybe apathy, just kind of fatigue overall. So if you have maybe been on a plant-based diet for, for a few months now and you feel like your energy is super low, but you feel like you're consuming adequate calories, it might be worth getting iron levels um, assessed by your physician. You know, um, shortness of breath, um, weakness, just feeling kind of weak, brittle nails, brittle hair, um, even kind of seeing stars if you stand up really fast, those can be some signs of iron deficiency and anemia. So those are worth kind of looking into if that sounds like you. Um, on the next slide, we can find some different iron sources. So there's a little different types of iron depending on if we're getting it from animals or if we're getting it from plant-based products. So our heme iron is coming from our plant or from our animals. It's found in animal proteins, so meat, fish, poultry, um, you know, even eggs and milk can, can can have some iron in it as well. And so again, these are going to be a little bit more. This iron is a little bit more readily accessible to our body. We can absorb it a little bit better. Whereas our non-heme iron found in our plants, we don't absorb it quite as well. And so, um, and we really don't get quite as much in, in some of those plant-based foods. So you can kind of see them there. One thing that I do recommend for a lot of my plant-based athletes is if you have a cast iron skillet, preparing some of your food, um, maybe your plant-based food in a cast iron skillet, you can actually absorb 
iron from, like, so the iron in the skillet will absorb a little bit into your food and you can get some that way. And so that's kind of an interesting thing. Also that um, molasses, like black backstrap molasses is an interesting plant-based iron source. So if you're, if you're not quite where you need um, a supplement, um, but you're looking to kind of up your iron through your food, then those might be some interesting ways to do it. There are also some things in our, our foods that may inhibit iron absorption. So things like phytates that we find in some of our nuts and seeds and whole grains, um, the tannins and tea, coffee, and cocoa will inhibit iron absorption. And then calcium is a really big competitor um, or inhibitor of iron absorption. So if you are consuming iron or if your goal is to kind of consume more iron rich foods, thinking about maybe not including some of those foods alongside them. Um, but things that we can help improve our iron absorption is vitamin C or um, citric acid and things like that. So um, cooking, you know, some of our iron plant-based iron sources with um, other sources of vitamin C can be helpful ways to improve that absorption. Um, Commonly, your doctors, if they recommend a supplement, will tell you to take it with something like orange juice or some kind of um, juice because that vitamin C will, will enhance the absorption. And so if we are iron deficient, what are some solutions? So on that next slide, um, really, I think if, if it, some of those symptoms sound familiar to you, I would really recommend seeing your physician and, and getting an, what's called an iron panel done. So sometimes just the regular blood workup doesn't quite indicate if we are iron deficient um, or anemic. And so doing the actual iron panel where they look at your ferritin stores, which is kind of our iron stores, as well as some other markers, may be a little bit more indicative if we truly have some iron deficiency and or iron deficiency anemia. Um, it's also, um, it's also important if you do get put on an iron supplement to get those levels checked because we can, we can store iron and iron can be toxic if we consume too much of it. So, you know, getting kind of yearly levels if you're on an iron supplement or if you've just been kind of chronically low in iron is, is not a bad idea. Typically, um, supplement values or how much you should take will vary depending on how deficient you are. And so that will be kind of a call made by your doctor. But typically the type of iron um, that's best absorbed is going to be that ferrous sulfate option. And so um, I would recommend kind of prioritizing those in, when you're picking out an iron supplement. Okay, next is calcium and vitamin D. So these kind of go hand in hand. Um, if you are someone who does consume dairy, you are probably okay with your calcium and vitamin D. So we get a lot of calcium from dairy and, and a lot of times our dairy products are fortified with vitamin D. If you are a vegan or you are not consuming any kind of dairy, you're probably a little bit more at risk for, defic for calcium deficiency. Um, and again, some of these more plant-based foods may, like iron, kind of inhibit some of that calcium absorption. The reason we worry about calcium and vitamin D is for our bones. Um, so uh, calcium uh, obviously is kind of what makes our bones strong and vitamin D actually helps us absorb calcium. And so if we're, we have calcium, but maybe we're missing vitamin D, we're not gonna absorb that calcium as well into our bones. And if our calcium level is low, so if we're not consuming a lot of calcium in our diet, well, then your body's probably gonna start pulling it from your bones. And so that's how we maybe get lower bone mineral density or weaker bones if we're not consuming enough calcium in our diet. So that's kind of what we're on the lookout for is, is avoiding your body having to pull from those calcium stores in your bones. So what's kind of general recommended amounts on the next slide, it will be about a thousand to, uh, oh, I think it got cut off a little bit there, sorry. So it's a thousand to about 1200 milligrams of calcium per day. And so in the U.S., most of that is coming from dairy intake. If you're not drinking dairy, the nice thing about the United States and our food system is that they require any kind of 
non-dairy milks, so our plant-based milks, to be fortified with calcium and vitamin D. So if you're consuming an almond milk or a soy milk, um, it is most likely fortified with calcium and vitamin D. So that can be a good option for you as well if um, cow's milk isn't really your thing. Also, um, things like orange juice will a lot of times be fortified with calcium and vitamin D too. You can look for that on the label. And then again, having vitamin D alongside calcium will help with that, with that um, absorption and transport into your bones. Um, if you're not into dairy, there's on the next slide, there's some non-dairy calcium options. So tofu is actually a really great, so not only is it a great protein source, it also has a fair amount of calcium. Some of our vegetables will be there, but remember some of those vegetables have things um, like oxalates that can inhibit some of that calcium absorption, fish um, and fish with bones. So if you like sardines um, or anything like that, uh, you can get some good calcium that way. Fortified cereals. And then again, you can kind of see some of those um, plant-based milks or juice options will be good calcium and vitamin D sources as well. So like we've mentioned, it's vitamin D is linked to um, calcium absorption. Um, you are probably at risk for a cal or for a vitamin D deficiency if you have darker skin pigmentation. Now I put a little asterisk next to this one because I it's a little bit controversial. So um, we typically see lower vitamin D blood levels in um, people who have darker skin tones, but what we don't see are the same rates of like um, fractures with with those people that we would see in maybe someone with lighter skin color. And so what we think is actually happening is we're not quite measuring the right thing if, um, for, for those darker skinned um, athletes. And so there may be a more um, accurate biomarker, um, but it's pretty expensive. And so um, not everybody's gonna do it. So if you have darker skin, you may come up as vitamin D deficient based on the, the kind of um, biomarkers that we use now. Supplementing is okay, but you probably don't need really large amounts of supplementation either. Um, those who train indoor or um, during darkness, which I'm, most of you guys are indoors most of the time for dance, and so if you're not getting that sunlight exposure, you can be at risk for vitamin D deficiency. And then in the winter months, so it's kind of nice in Houston where we're a little bit more Southern, so we get pretty good sunlight throughout the year. If you ever move north um, of, I think, 20 uh, degrees on the latitude, that's when you can really miss out on some of that sunlight. And so the sources of our vitamin D is, um, our best source really is the sunlight. There's not a lot of vitamin D in our food. So really it's, we make vitamin D when UV lights hit our skin and um, create vitamin D3, which is the one that we're looking for. So if you could shoot for about 10 minutes per day with no sunscreen um, and like have your arms and legs exposed, then you can get pretty adequate levels of vitamin D, at least here in Houston where we have a lot of good direct sunlight. So I see some of you guys sitting outside. So that's great, you're getting your vitamin D that way. Um, if not, or if you come back low on your blood levels, you may benefit from a, a lower dose of supplementation. So that 1,000 to 2,000 IU dose is appropriate um, for that as well. And again, we're looking for vitamin D3. A lot of our plant, or a lot of our food sources of vitamin D are D2, um, which vitamin D3 is actually our, our, our most useful form of that vitamin. Um, and so a lot of times that's going to come from animal sources, but there are some plant-based supplements as well. So if you are committed to a more plant-based diet, then those are available to you. Okay, last one for some of our vegan vegetarian friends is B12. So if you do not consume any, any animal products, you are likely not getting enough B12. If you are maybe consuming milk and or eggs, you are probably getting there. Um, for B12 deficiency, we have we end up with a type of anemia, which leads to fatigue and potentially poor performance. You may actually experience some tingling if your uh, if your deficiency gets really bad, poor cognition, poor digestion, right? And so B12 is only found in animal foods. And so really, if you are on a strict vegan diet, I would recommend a B12 supplement for all of you. Um, so on that next slide, you can see some foods that have are maybe fortified with B12. So things like nutritional yeast, which I know some people will kind of sprinkle on different meals. Some of our soy milk will be fortified with 
B12 breakfast cereals um, and meat analogs. So if you're doing any kind of like Beyond Meat or um, maybe some of that, um, some of those, I can't think of the different brands now, but there's a lot of different brands of those meat substitutes. Those typically have some B12 in them as well. If not, I think a supplement, honestly, if I, if you are vegan, I would just go ahead and take a supplement. Um, and so finding there are vegan um, B12 supplements available as well. Let me see. I think I saw a question in here. Okay, so someone said, I heard that placing mushrooms under sunlight before eating them helps the mushrooms absorb, absorb vitamin D. I haven't heard that. I would have to look into, into that a little bit more. Um, you know, maybe instead of placing the mushrooms in the sun, you could just sit out in the sun. I don't know. But, um, but yeah, I, I don't know about that. And there may be some kind of, you know, transformation going on, you know, same thing with the UV rays into the mushrooms, but I, I haven't heard that before. That's a good question. Okay. Uh, last topic that I want to touch on with you guys is just the risks of underfueling. Um, and so some of you may have heard of the female athlete triad. Unfortunately, at least in the research that I was looking at, this is pretty common in dancers, again, because there is such an emphasis on aesthetic and the way your body looks. A lot of times it can lead to underfueling or what we call low energy availability, which is essentially eating under that 30 kcals per kilogram of fat-free mass, which a lot of times that will lead to menstrual dysfunction and low bone mineral density. So having not consuming enough energy can really take a toll on your bones. And then if we aren't having normal menstrual cycles, we're not getting those hormone fluctuation, there's also a chance that that can negatively impact our bones as well. So we know a lot about the female athlete triad. Most recently, we've had, um, we've kind of expanded the definition to relative energy deficiency in sport. Um, and you guys definitely count in sport there as well. And it all kind of hinges on this idea of energy availability. So essentially energy availability is, so you eat your energy in food, and then we subtract all of the energy that you expend during exercise. And so what's left over after that? So how much energy do you have left over after exercise? That's what's left, that's your energy availability. So you have to think about most of your energy expenditure that your body or the most of the energy that your body's expending is kind of happening in the background. So exercise is not our greatest amount of energy expended typically. It's really, um, it's really like all of those cellular processes, um, keeping your immune system going, digesting your food, keeping your heart beating, your lungs breathing, all of that stuff takes energy that we don't even think about, we don't even notice, but that's really where most of our energy is coming from. So if we're under consuming, and then we are training, we have to put that energy towards our training. Our body has to do that because we're forcing it to move. So really what's kind of getting the short end of the stick is everything kind of running in the background. And so you can kind of see, we know, we know from the female athlete triad that we, we can lose our periods and that we can have um, negative bone health or we can have negative effects on our bone. But really what we're starting to realize is this energy, this low energy availability is if impacting a lot more things than just menstrual health and bones. So our immune system is down. Um, a lot of times gastrointestinal issues are kind of our first sign that there is something um, potentially, or we're maybe under fueling a little bit. You know, your, your heart isn't gonna be able to beat as hard and as fast. We're gonna see a, a reduction in our metabolic rate. So our body knows we're just not getting enough energy. So it's gonna start to slow everything down a little bit. Psychological issues, you can see there's actually an arrow going both ways here. So energy, low energy availability can impact our, our mental health and also mental health can impact our, our energy availability as well growth and development. We may have um, issues um, with blood deficiencies, iron deficiencies, things like that. And then also our hormones can be impacted. So I like this idea of the relative energy deficiency because it also includes male athletes. And so male athletes are experiencing all of these things just like female athletes are. On the female side with the hormones, we typically see estrogen levels drop. And then our males, we don't have quite as clear a picture in the research, but we're really starting to tie that to um, testosterone. So males who are operating in low energy availability for a long time typically have lower testosterone levels, which again can have negative impacts 
on the bone as well. Um, so on the next slide, again, this is just an example of how we calculate energy availability. So our calories in via food minus our exercise, um, and then dividing that by fat-free mass. And that's how I kind of set that 30 kcals per kilogram of fat-free mass. Anything less than that, and we are gonna start to see issues with energy um, and with um, some of those other physiological systems in our body. Optimally, we're getting around 45 kcals per kilogram of fat-free mass. So kind of striving towards getting closer to that optimal level. Um, on the next slide, again, I think this is just a prettier picture of kind of what I showed in the beginning, but um, this idea of this energy deficiency really impacting a lot of different um, body systems and really, really impacting those. And it goes into a little bit more detail on the next slide. Um, and so you can see um, hormonal disruption being a really, a really important one. And this, this ties a lot into our resting metabolic rate and also our, our reproductive function um, and our bone health as well. And, um, you know, being in a stressful environment kind of compounds these things. So if you're training for a really big performance um, and there's maybe pressure for you to look a certain way or um, to lose weight, um, then all of these things can kind of lead you down a path of destruction if we're if we're not if we're not careful, um, and so then I always want to touch on um, disordered eating and eating disorders again because I think this is something that is uniquely prevalent in the dance community community because of the focus on aesthetic, and so um, some of the things that may be considered as disordered eating are are going to be having this all or nothing rules around food. So like I cannot eat. XYZ foods, I can only eat ABC foods, right? So kind of creating those really hard lines in the sand eventually can be hard on, on mental health. If you avoid eating out with others or if you feel anxiety about eating out with others, um, if you're going long periods of time without eating deliberately, you're skipping meals deliberately. If you are obsessively counting calories or macronutrients in your food that's, and it's keeping you up at night and it's making you stressed out, that's probably not great. Um, feeling any kind of guilt or shame around eating certain foods or feeling anxious. So these are all kind of signs that maybe our relationship with food isn't super health healthy if you're kind of feeling these things consistently. And then on the next slide, you can see just some warning signs that you maybe are in energy deficit or you're operating at kind of a low energy availability. So for females, if you are not on birth control, if you start missing periods, this is a pretty good indicator that we are not getting enough energy in to kind of cover all of our physiological needs and exercise. And so that's, I know periods aren't like kind of a nuisance sometimes, but they're a really great barometer into making sure that we have enough energy um, in our system. For males, it's a little bit differently. You may see a decline in your erectile function. So again, those dropping testosterone levels can impact um, your sex hormones and sex organs as well. If we start losing muscle mass, um, if you have difficulties staying um, warm in the winter or cool in the summer, so regulating your body temperature, you may start to see this um, downy growth of hair over your arms and legs, and that's your body's response to being really low energy and saying, I just, I can't keep us warm, so I'm going to try to put this hair on us to keep us warm. Um, Behavior-wise, preoccupation with food, if we're not sleeping well, we're really restrictive or really controlled on our food intake, we don't feel like we can take rest days, maybe we have um, fear of different foods or fear of gaining weight back or anxiety. We were withdrawn. We're not going out with friends. We're not eating with friends. Um, maybe we're seeing on the performance side of things, just like really poor performance. We're really fatigued all the time. Again, those digestive issues popping up, that's kind of my first. That's typically what I see first when I counsel athletes who are experiencing energy deficiency is they start having these weird GI issues that pop up. We're losing strength and maybe we're working really hard, but we're just not seeing any improvement. So all of these things can be signs that point to um, that energy deficiency. So on that last slide there, um, so these are kind of the performance effects. So kind of like we touched about, we don't have a lot of energy, we don't have any more strength, our endurance is down, um, maybe we're irritable, we're depressed, um, we don't feel like we can concentrate, we have decreased coordination, which is super important for dancers, impaired judgment, um, and just we're not seeing the same kind of responses to our training as we were before.
So all that to say, um, it is really important to take care of your bodies and, and getting adequate nutrients as, as far as like calories and energy and but also those micronutrients are, are super, super important to your health and well-being as a dancer. So if you have questions, that is my email. Um, I would love to, um, to address those things kind of one-on-one -on -one with you guys. And again, we have kind of those discounted rates for individual consults if you think that would be something you'd be interested in. So, all right, I think that is it. And it, um, I'm, that's it for me. Thank you guys so much. I'll take any questions if um, anybody wants to put them in the chat box. I'll put my email in there as well too for you guys. Thank you so much, Christina. Yeah. Um, somebody just asked in the chat, can you absorb vitamin D through window sunlight? That's an interesting question. I would think potentially yes, because you know, you can still get kind of sunburnt if you like sat by a window long enough. So I think some UV rays are getting there, um, but maybe not quite as much as if you had, you were just outside in direct sunlight. That's a good question. Any other questions either in the chat or um, you can unmute yourself if there are any questions that you would like to ask out in the group. Crunchies. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that one. <laughs> I think that's just getting old, right? <laughs> Maybe more of a, of a physical therapy question. Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, which Lauren, um, we should definitely connect you to next month's um, <laughs> injury clinic that Memorial Herman Ironman Sports Medicine Center also um, helps us with. Um, so everybody on the call today will, um, will receive an email next week with the link to this recording as well as information about our um, monthly dancer injury clinic um, where you can uh, receive a, a free one-on-one um, uh, -on -one appointment with physical therapists to address you know some imbalances or an existing injury um, like especially during the last few months we've all certainly um, like been dancing in, in different spaces. Um, and so I'm sure there are lots of new strange things going on physically in our bodies that, um, that should be addressed. Um, we did just get a few more questions. Yeah, I'll, yeah, I'll address the ketogenic one. Um, it's not my favorite diet. It is pretty restrictive in terms of the foods that it's cutting out. So you cut out a lot of those whole grains. Um, you cut out um, a lot of fiber sources, fruits and vegetables tend to be kind of limited. And so from that perspective, I prefer diets that include lots of different foods um, just for nutrients, um, micronutrients sake. Um, it is okay, I guess, you know, some people do really well. I found that my athletes tend to not do well on the ketogenic diet because it is so low in carbohydrates. So if you have any kind of intensity that you're trying to reach with your training, it's going to be really hard to do that because of the, the low carbohydrates on the ketogenic diet. Um, so yeah, I, I, it can work for some people, but it's typically not my favorite because of the, um, because of the restriction or like the, the restriction of the foods. Um, someone asked about supplements for injury. Yeah, so glucosamine, chondroitin, there's a little bit of data that says it can help with um, joint pain. And then there's some data that says it really doesn't. So if it works for you, I think that's fine. Um, magnesium, potentially, um, I haven't seen as much on that. Really, if you are rehabbing an injury, making sure that your protein intake is consistent so that we are actually able to build and repair and strengthen up those muscles around whatever injury um, that is. And yeah, just making sure you have a, a well-balanced diet and getting a lot of those micronutrients in as well. Um, oh, asking about pineapple. Um, Spray my ankle, I've been eating pineapple three times a day. Supposed to help with rebuilding the muscles, a tie in bromelain. Yes, so bromelain is, um, is definitely a nutrient in pineapples. I haven't seen any data on it helping with sports injuries. 
I, I mean, I like pineapple. So I guess as long as your tongue's not super raw, <laughs> go for it. Um, I don't know that it's any, any more effective than, um, than anything else. I would say, again, just kind of focus on those high quality proteins. Um, you could try some anti-inflammatory foods. So things like berries and nuts and whole grains and um, dark leafy greens do have some anti-inflammatory properties to, to bring down um, maybe some of that swelling and inflammation around the sprain. Um, okay. Um, so someone asked about, um, how do you healthily lose weight from being in quarantine and building back muscle? That would probably be something that, um, we could in there, like address one-on-one. -on -one. It's a little bit different from everybody for everybody. And so that's, that's kind of hard to answer, um, generally. Um, someone asked if I cook my meals with olive oil, would that replace my daily fats? Not necessarily replace it. Um, that's a good source of daily fat. Um, but just cooking your meals in olive oil probably isn't getting you to your, your kind of total daily needs. So don't feel like you can't include nuts and seeds or peanut butter, or avocados and things like that as well. Um, okay, I think that's it. Um, again, yeah, if you guys wanna reach out to, via email, I'm happy to kind of discuss more there individually or we could set up um, one of those um, consults. Um, feel about intermittent fasting. Again, it's some people do it. Some people do it like they just don't eat breakfast and so they're technically intermittent fasting. And so um, if that works for you, that's okay. Um, I don't like really long prolonged fasting, uh, especially if you're training because thinking about that muscle protein synthesis and wanting to get that protein timing kind of on point. If it's maybe a time where you're not training as intensely and you feel like that's a more comfortable eating pattern for you, um, I think that's fine as long as you're, you're not kind of under doing too few calories and, and we're making sure we're hitting all those macro and micronutrient needs as well. Um, Foods before competition, what you're comfortable with. Don't introduce anything new. Um, don't try to do something super spicy or crazy. Um, make sure that you are comfortable, you've practiced those foods. So things that you would eat kind of consistently and then have carbohydrates because that's what's gonna you know, give you the energy that you need to perform well. Um, nutritional implications that have to do with darker skin tones. I think vitamin D is kind of the biggest one. Um, and you are likely, um, getting the same amounts of vitamin D from the sun when you're outside, as long as you're not wearing sunscreen, it's just gonna show up a little bit differently in your biomarkers. And so just talk to your doctor, having a, a 1000 to 2000 IU supplement is, is perfectly fine if that's what you decide that you need, so, okay. Thank you so much, Christina, yes. for awesome. um, all of this information, for answering um, all of those questions. Um, you will receive everybody some, some follow-up information. Um, and yeah, thank you so much. This yeah. is really helpful, really informative. And I'm so happy that there were so many folks here on the call today. Um, this was a great way to kick off what will be, um, a series of, of workshop webinars like this, um, as well as some some movement and meditation classes led by, by artists from um, a, a mindful um, mind-body balancing focus, which we all really need right now. Um, so we look forward to sharing more of those opportunities with you. Christina, thank you so, so, so much. And thank you everybody for being on this call today. Have a great weekend. Bye, thank you. Bye.